When somebody comes and says, John, I want to be a leader, I always ask him the question, why? Why do you want to be a leader? I mean, do you want to be a leader because you want a corner office? Do you want to be a leader because you like to be in control? Do you like to want to be a leader because you love to be in the front of the pack? Do you want to be a leader because you want to have a good parking place? Why do you want to be a leader? Because leadership isn't easy. Leadership a lot of times isn't fun. Leadership a lot of times is kind of lonely. There's only one reason to be a leader, and that is to add value to people. And you and I will only add value to people if we truly value them. I have a nonprofit organization equipped that's trained almost 2 million leaders internationally around the world. And I kid you not, as I go to developing countries twice a year and I travel internationally and I sit down, sometimes I have the privilege of being in the offices of presidents of countries. And as I watch these developing countries, the thing that is the cardinal sin among leadership so much is that they have leaders of their countries that truly don't value the people people and if you and I don't value people we will devalue people number two if you want to add value to people you have to make yourself more valuable you just have to get better you have to keep growing you have to keep learning you have to keep developing why very simply if you're leading the pack you've got to be able to give what you have and you can't give what you don't have and so therefore you've got to put a lot of good stuff in so that you can pass it on to others and share with them and and add value to them thirdly if you want to add value to people you have to know and relate to what other people value. You and I have to walk slowly through the crowd. We have to listen. We have to care. You see, great leaders are first of all listeners, and then they're learners, and then they're leaders. They really do take their cue from the people. They understand that the key of leadership is connecting with the people that you lead, and the only way that you and I ever connect is by caring enough to listen. Number four is very important to me. When I'm speaking in the business community, I always share with them that for them, there are three ways to add value to people, but for me, there are four. And I tell them, I'll give them the three. And, in, and so I'll, I'll spend maybe an hour doing those three things I just shared with you, talking about how to add value to people. And inevitably, when I'm done with the three, somebody raised their hand and say, John, you said that for you there was four, but you said there's only three for us. I said, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's nothing personal, but th this is about my faith. And so I, I don't really need to share this with you because I'm trying to help you and I, I, I don't want to cross boundaries with you. And inevitably, they'll say, but John, tell us what yours is. And I'll say, well, okay, you can hear mine, but don't write it down. In fact, don't listen because number four for me is if I really want to add value to people, I have to do the things that God values. How would you tell us to develop a habit yeah. of curiosity? Well, you know what? People do look at me and see me as creative because I've written so many books, and I am curious. But when I started off in college, in, 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 my, in my freshman psych class, they gave us a, a test that he, for each student to take on creativity. And there were 17 in that class. I can remember it well. And I was at the bottom of the class on creativity. I mean, I was like number 17 out of 17. And, 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 and it, what, the teacher posted the scores, and so I mean, I saw how bad I was. And, and, and then I really felt bad, not only because I wasn't creative, but I was going to go pastor, I was going to go into ministry, I was going to teach, I was going to do sermons. And then I got to thinking to myself, I'm going to be another boring preacher. And you know, that just gripped me. I thought, oh, this is going to be awful. I'm going to bore people all my life, you know what I mean? And, and then I'm going to ask them to pay while they hear me. I mean, this is an awful deal. So, and, and, and so two things I did. And I talk about it in the book. One, one is I started filing. I started taking thoughts and quotes. And the reason I started doing that is I thought, if I'm not going to be good at what I say, I need to quote somebody that is good. And so I started filing things that other people would say. So I'd go around and I'd say, well, Ken said, you know what I mean? And Joe said, and Susie said, and so that at least I would be a little bit more interested. And that's how it started. When you realize things in your life happen for you truly, especially in hindsight. Everybody knows it in hindsight, right? If you look back at any disaster, tragedy, most people look back five, 10 years later, they go, that happened for me. That was actually a good thing. And so I was unemployed, I couldn't find a job. And my old man, my dad, was the best dad role model you could ever have in your yeah. life. Hardworking man, good man, he's a better man than me, he has more integrity than me, he's the best man I've ever known. But when I was growing up, my dad had a drinking problem. And so my dad had gotten sober recently and he was going to these meetings and he comes home from one of his meetings and says, there's a guy at my meeting who can get you a job. And it's right down the street in San Dimas. You're going to be working with kids. Doesn't pay anything at six bucks an hour, but you're going to get this damn job. So show up there tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Ask for Tim. <laughs> so I walked, it's, I drive down there. It's a place called McKinley Home for Boys. Little did I know that would alter my entire life. That was the most significant thing that happened huh. to me. And so I walk in there, I said, I'm Ed Milet, I'm here for the job. They're like, what job? I'm like, I don't know, just my dad told me to show up here. Yeah. 
I need to ask for Tim. They're like, we have no idea who the hell Tim is. What's his last name? I said, I, I, I don't I don't know his last name. And they're like, so you showed up for a job that you don't know what it is and you don't know who it is that's hiring you. I'm like, here's what I know. He's an alcoholic. I'm like, oh, Tim. Tim. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. know that Tim. <laughs> and so they bring me to the guy and he says, uh, you're hired. Let's go. Like literally shakes my hand and you're hired. And he introduces me to these eight boys that were my boys. They were seven, eight, and nine years old. And basically I lived with these boys, these precious boys. And we ended up adding a few more. My boys were all wards of the court. They were all molested by family mm. where parents were in prison. And so they had no family. And so my whole life changed. All of a sudden these became, I'm this 22 year old guy. These guys become my sons. I, I lived with them. It altered me completely. Wow. Like what I wanted to do. I always wanted to be famous and rich and successful. And now I just wanted to serve. Yeah. I wanted to help. Little, little did I find out I could get rich and famous and all that other stuff I thought I wanted through serving people, right? And so just altered. Yeah. We really do acquire what we're most obsessed with. So if you're obsessed with your worries and your stresses and your problems, you will find a freaking way to obsess on them and you'll eventually possess them. Mm -hmm. Same with the things you want. People think that's corny, but I'll give you an example, an addict. Addicts take all different kinds of forms, but we could go out on the street here. And by the way, I want to make sure that people understand this. Not everybody that lives on the street is an addict. They've mm -hmm. got mental illness or they, some people actually chosen to live there. Mm -hmm. But if we found an addict that was living on the street, yep. no job, no income, no source of money, they find a way to get their drug, don't mm -hmm. they? You find a way. If you're obsessed with something enough, regardless of the conditions, and addicts are the perfect example, they can have no money, no resources, been locked up before, everyone knows they're trying to get it, they could be in support me, but if they want that drug bad enough with no resources, no nothing, they find a way to get it. That's how humans are when they get obsessed with something. So don't tell me you can't win. Don't tell me you can't build your company. You can't get the person you want or the money you want. If you want it like an addict, bad analogy, but true, you want yeah. it like an addict needs their fix, yeah. you'll find a way to get it. That's yeah. how human beings are. So then the next best predictor of lifetime success is conscientiousness. Well, so, and of the, of the two aspects of conscientiousness, say orderliness and and industriousness, the better predictor is industriousness. So the question is, well, what can you do about your industriousness? And the answer to that is, well, that's kind of rough too, because there's a strong genetic component, but you can work on micro habits with regards to your conscientiousness. And I think the best micro habits, this is partly to do with this future authoring program processes. I think the best thing you can do with regards to your conscientiousness is to set up some aims for yourself, goals that you actually value. And the future authoring program helps people do that. And basically it does a, a situational analysis of, it helps you do a situational analysis of your life more than a psychological analysis, I would say. And so, so the questions are something like, well, all right, you're gonna have to put some effort into your life and you need to be motivated to do that. And so what are the potential sources of motivation? Well, you could think about them in, in the big five manner. You know, if you're extroverted, you want friends. If you're agreeable, you want an intimate relationship. If you're disagreeable, you want to win competitions. If you're open, you want to engage in creative activity. If you're high in neuroticism, you want security. Okay, so those are all sources of potential motivation that you could draw on, that you could tailor to your own, you know, your own personality. But then there are dimensions that you want to consider your life across. And so we ask people about, well, you know, if you could have your life the way you wanted it in three to five years, if you were taking care of yourself properly, you know, what would you want from your friendships? What would you want from your intimate relationship? How would you like to structure your family? What do you want for your career? Well, how are you going to use your time outside of your job? And how are you going to regulate your mental, physical, mental and physical health? And maybe also your drug and alcohol use, because that's, that's a good place to auger down, you know, because alcoholism, for example, wipes out, you know, five to 10% of people. So you want to keep that under control. And then, and then, so maybe, you know, you, you, you develop a vision of what your life, what you would like your life to be. And that associates the, so the goal, well, once the goal is established and then you break down the goal into micro processes that you can implement, the micro processes become rewarding in proportion, in relation to their uh, causal association with the goal. And that tangles in your your incentive reward system. You know, we talked about the dopaminergic incentive reward system, and that's the thing that keeps you moving forward. And the way it works is that it works better if it produces positive emotion when it can see you moving towards a valued goal. Okay, well, what's the implication of that? Life better have a valued goal because otherwise you can't get any positive motivation working out. And so the more valuable the goal, in principle, the more the micro processes associated with that goal start to take on a positive charge. 
And so what that means is, well, you get up in the morning and you're excited to, about the day. You're ready to go. And so as far as I can tell, what you do is you specify your long-term ideal. Maybe you also specify a place you want to stay the hell away from so that you're terrified to fail as well as excited about succeeding, because that's also useful. You specify your goal. You do that in some sense as a unique individual. You want to, you want to specify goals that make you say, oh, if that could happen as a consequence of my efforts, it would clearly be worthwhile. Hi, welcome back to Mind Control, where we inspire and motivate you. Hope you enjoy the video. Now, Shof also said, when you find out something that works, put the information in your journal. Don't use your head for a filing cabinet. Put it in your journal so that you can do the next best thing. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Go over it. And if you repeat it, go over it, sure enough, someday, some mysterious day, the idea takes root, starts to grow, and shows up in your bank account, and your dress, and your personality, and your lifestyle. But capture the ideas in your journal. Find out how things work. Shof gave me this word for my life change. He said, study. Great word. If you wish to be successful, study success. If you wish to be happy, study happiness. If you wish to be wealthy, study wealth. Don't leave it to chance. Make it a study. Some people just go through the day with their fingers crossed. See, that won't do it. You've got to study the things that can change your economic, social, spiritual, personal life. Now, here's a qualifying phrase. And we'll have several of these qualifying phrases throughout the seminar. Here's the first one. You may not be able to do all you find out. I understand that. You may not be able to do all you find out, but you should find out all you can do. See, you don't want to wind up at the end of your life and discover that you've lived only one-tenth of it. And the other nine-tenths went down the drain. Not for lack of opportunity, for lack of information. So that's number one, find out how things work. Now here's the best human virtue for finding out, curiosity. Make a note of that, curiosity, be curious. You might add a word to it that'll help, childish curiosity. What will kids do if they wanna know something bad enough? Bug you, that's the phrase. They can ask a thousand questions. You think they're through, they got another thousand. They'll drive you to the brink. It's a virtue. When you gotta know, be like a child. In fact, Jesus, the master teacher said, unless you can become like little children, you might as well forget it, you don't have a prayer. Excellent advice. You gotta be like children. Four ways, in my opinion, to be like a child. Number one's curiosity, and number two is excitement. Get excited like a child over your ability to make yourself do anything for change. Third is faith. Have faith like a child. Adults are too skeptical. And fourth is trust. Trust is a childish virtue, but the rewards are incredible. Now here's the second step to personal development. Okay, number one was find out how things work. Here's number two, go to work. You must now take action on what you found out. In doing business around the world, we call it game plan. Put together your game plan. One of the major things we teach on the weekend seminars, game plans. How to game plan your office. If you're in sales, you need a game plan. Kids need a game plan. You need a home game plan, social game plan, a business game plan. Everybody needs game plans. Financial independence, game plan. Your investment, game plan. Don't think in your head, put it on paper. Don't operate out of your mind. Operate from paper. I often ask somebody, what are you going to do the next six months? And somebody starts to tell me. I say, no, don't tell me. Show me. Show me your game plan for the next six months. Then I can look at things and maybe I can help. But you got to operate from paper. Put it on a game plan. Take action on what you found out. Now here's the best word I know of to go with action. Massive. See, that'll change everything. Massive action is called the cure-all. If you're gonna make calls, make a few thousand. 
If you're gonna make contacts, make a few thousand. If you're gonna knock on doors, knock on a few thousand. See, that'll change everything. Here's the language of the poor. I'll try it a time or two and see what happens. It's the way poor people talk. The guy says, well, I'll give it 30 days. 30 days, you could guess his bank balance. You've got to have a better game plan. So here's one of the major things to do starting tomorrow. Take a look at your game plan. If it isn't loaded with massive action, change it tomorrow. Action. The formula really works like this. Pick up a good idea, take heavy action. Pick up a couple of good ideas, take heavy action. That's the formula for sex, success. Heavy action. It's a good thing we can edit all this, right? The formula for success, take heavy action on a good idea, right? That's the ratio. Now here's the key. Don't wait till you've learned two or 3,000 things. Because that way you'll use up all the time. And you could wind up smart and broke. And hey, it's okay to be dumb and broke. But if a guy's smart and broke, that's pitiful. Don't let your learning lead to knowledge. You'll become a fool. Let your learning lead to action. You can become wealthy. And there's many kinds of wealth, I understand that, not just money. Money's one of the least of all values. I know some people with a lot of money that are very poor. Evita sings, as for fortune and as for fame, they are illusions. They're not the solutions they promised to be. So there's all kinds of wealth, but to get a big share coming your way, you've got to have a heavy action game plan. Now here's the third step to personal development and we'll wrap up personal development. Step number three, it's just a little caution and all through life we need little cautions. This one simply says, don't try to beat the system. Find out how it works, work it, but don't try to beat it. Some people learn just enough to start slicing it, shading it, thinning it, cutting corners, and looking for cheap answers. See, don't fall for that. You'll wind up with a cheap life. Find out how it works best and do it that way. Even though it seems to take a little longer, do it right. Don't compromise with right. Now under this step, here's another key. Be a quick learner. Don't let it take long to teach you learn quicker. One guy said he broke his nose seven times in the same place. Somebody says, looks like you'd stay out of that place. <laughs> learn quicker. Now the third point here is don't be stubborn. See, some people won't change even when a better way comes. They say, well, I've been doing it this way 30 years. Hey, be ready for change. If it's a better way, go for it. But don't try to beat it. We'd like to thank you so much for watching till the end. Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments section. Please also like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends and families. Please watch our other motivational videos. Thank you again. Because you'll never earn your way to financial f fortune. Even people that make just loads of money, the actors, the actresses, the athletes, where are they 10 and 15 years later? I mean, uh, 50 Cent made a hundred million dollars on vitamin water. He got a tip and he got like a two or three hundred million dollar net worth and he's bankrupt. He bought Mike Tyson's house, 25,000 square feet, and Mike Tyson made a half a billion dollars and went bankrupt. Right now, I don't know if you saw Johnny Depp, I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but the papers are saying he may go bankrupt. He made three quarters of a billion dollars as a movie star, but he spent $30,000 a month on wine. He must be feeling good. And secondly, he took Hunter Thompson, the reporter. He burned his body and paid $3 million to blow his ashes into the sky in a cannon. So no matter how much money you make, you can screw it up, right? But if you will just decide there's a percentage of my income 
that no matter what, I'm going to have it automated. I'm not going to see it. It's going to go straight to an investment account. And I don't know if it's 10 or 15 or 20. Those numbers sound gigantic to most people. Even if you start with five and build, that income does not go to anybody else. And then you put that into compounding. Because the infinite player understands sometimes you're ahead and sometimes you're behind. Sometimes your product is better and sometimes it's worse. The goal isn't to be the best every day. The goal isn't to, out, to outdo your competition every day. That's a finite construction. If I had said to Microsoft, I've got the new iPod Touch and it's so much better than your Zoom, they would have said, can we see it? What does it do? React, 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 react. Finite players play to, be be to beat the people around them. Infinite players play to be better than themselves to wake up every single day and say, how can we make our company a better version of itself today than it was yesterday? How can we create a product this week that's better than the product we created last week? We also have to play the infinite game. It's not about being ranked number one. It's not about having more followers on Twitter than your friends. It's not about outdoing anyone. It's about how to outdo yourself. It's not about selling more books or getting more TED views than somebody else. It's about how to make sure that the work that you're producing is better than the work you produced before. You are your competition. And that is what ensures you stay in the game the longest. And that is what ensures you find joy. Because the joy comes not from comparison, but from advancement. But the common wisdom, the, the old intelligence idea is to diversify. And what I believe in is, is something else, is increase your financial IQ, your financial like, intelligence, and instead focus. And what focus stands for is this. Focus is follow one course till you're successful. And so that's what I did in 1973. I, I, I signed up for my first real estate investment course. And I just did it and did it and did it. You know, I bought this one little $18,000 place. And I did it again and I did it again and I did it again until the point where I understood it. And then I went into uh, becoming an entrepreneur. And I did it and I did it and did it. And I'm still learning. And I'm still learning about real estate. And the reason, in 1966, I got into oil when I went to work for the Standard Oil Company. So today, I'm still focusing. I invest in oil and oil and oil. And I, and I don't diversify. You know, it doesn't mean I don't lose. Sometimes I am lose. Sometimes I make mistakes and all this. But I just don't buy good as with all the bad. If you're going to be successful as an investor, you know, diversification is good for the average investor. If that's what you want to be. Have a good life. But what I'd rather do is be able to know the good ones from the bad ones, the good investments from the bad investments, good advisors from the bad advisors, and what's good for me and what's not good for you. Because what I do is not necessarily what's going to work for you and vice versa. So that's why I really think instead of diversification or diversifying, the new rules of money say follow one course until you're successful and then keep doing it because once you find that way of being successful, you can do it again and again and again. So listen to this. There's a young man, true story, Theodore Johnson, 1950s, worked for UPS, never made more than $14,000 in annual income in his entire life, retired with $70 million and he didn't, you know, he didn't inherit a dime. He gave away $35 million more his life. Now, how is that possible? because of compound interest. When Andrew, all these investors say, what's the biggest mistake Americans make? He said, but they all said, they don't tap into compound interest. They know intellectually a little bit what it means, but they don't do it. Mm -hmm. They don't do it consistently. So what do you it do? It basically just means that the profits you make go back into the investment. You investors. keep reinvesting and it keeps growing, but it grows geometrically, right? Mm -hmm. And so a friend of his came to this man who worked for UPS and said, I'm going to make you rich. We're going to put a 20% tax on you. He said, I can't give up 20%. I can't pay my bills if I do that. Mm -hmm. He said, listen, if the government raised your taxes 20% and you'd claim, you'd scream, you'd cry, you'd complain, and you'd pay it, and you get adjusted to it. But he said, this is not going to the government. This is going into an account for your future. 
And that compounding is what made him that much money. Another part of your financial IQ is to know there's three types of income. So if you're going to say work hard, most people are working hard for earned income, and that's what these guys are working for. The trouble with earned income in America, your tax rate's approximately 50%, whereas Warren Buffett says it's a shame that his secretary pays a higher percentage in taxes than he did, although he makes billions of dollars. So when you say to a child, go to school and get a safe, secure job, you're telling them to work for earned income, the worst type of income. The second type of income is portfolio income, and today, as I speak, and they're trying to change this, it's about 20%. And portfolio income is generally known as capital gain. So if I buy a stock for $10 and I sell it for $50, the $40 gain is taxed at 20%. Or if I buy a house for $100,000 and I sell it for $200,000, that's a capital gains type event. So you pay a lot of tax for that. And the third type of income, which is the, which is the, um, best type of income, excuse me, I can't spell again, is passive income. And this is income that just comes in on a regular basis. One of the reasons I am wealthy and was able to retire at a young age is because I worked hard for passive income, not earned income. I don't flip real estate generally, not portfolio income. I don't flip stocks. I want passive income. So today, the new rules of money are it's important to understand what are you going to school to become ES entrepreneur or investor and what kind of income you're working hard for earned portfolio or passive and if you know what you're doing you can pay zero percent taxes legally and this can be done all over the world people say we can't do it in my country well these people can't do it in any country but in most parts of the world, governments need these people. So they're always giving tax incentives for, for investors and business owners who are for passive income. So those are some of the new rules of money. You've really got to know what you're working hard at and what kind of work are you performing? What kind of income are you working hard for? Now, the starting point of becoming a millionaire is to remember the greatest discovery of all of human life which is that you become what you think about most of the time. If you sincerely want to be rich to achieve all your financial goals and to retire as a self-made millionaire, one of the smartest things you can do is to develop the habits of thinking and acting that enable others to become self-made millionaires. What is so hard about this to understand? Most people are thinking of how little money they have, they worry about being broke, they're worried about lack and poverty, they're worried about the prices of everything, and they're wondering why they're not flourishing financially, because they're thinking about poverty and lack rather than prosperity and abundance. Now, these habits of financial success are learnable, as all habits are, by practice and repetition. In other words, you can program yourself to think like self-made millionaires. And remember, it has to start on the inside before it ever comes true on the outside. So when people try to f figure out how to make a million dollars, they have no idea how daunting that is. Because if you know how to make a million dollars, you go make it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But since you can't figure out how to a million dollar idea, you go somewhere and sit down. That's the wrong approach. If you apply your gift, your God-given gift that he gave you, you have millions already at your disposal if you break it down inch by inch in these things and cents or the 10 by 10 theory which is very simple you don't need a million dollar idea you need a 10 dollar idea you need something that you do your gift that god gave you to make 10 dollars that's all you got to be able to know i don't care if it's cutting hair cutting somebody's grass washing somebody's car I don't care if it's mowing somebody's lawn. I don't care if it's driving people to their destinations. I don't care if it's babysitting. I don't care if it's baking cookies or pie. You have some braiding somebody hair. You have something that you can do so well that someone will give you $10 for it. Write my paper for me. Do this for me. Somebody give you $10 for it.
Once they give you ten dollars, all you got to do is whatever you did to get that ten, do it ten more times. You now, my friend, have one hundred dollars. You have one dollar, one hundred dollars, simply because you took a ten dollar idea and you did it ten times. Well, guess what? If you take that one hundred dollars that you made since you done it ten times, and you do it ten more times. I got news for you, my friend. You now have one thousand dollars. One thousand dollars. You make a thousand dollars. Guess what? All you got to do. You got to multiply that effort again. Do whatever you did to do a thousand dollars. Do it ten more times, my friend. You now have ten thousand dollars. You got ten thousand dollars now. Imagine if you was making an extra ten thousand a month. Just imagine if you was making an extra ten thousand dollars a month. That's a hundred twenty thousand dollars a year. But I got news for you, my friend. Whatever you did, whatever you did, whatever it took to make yourself ten thousand dollars, all you got to do is do it ten more times. Ten more times, my friend. You now have one hundred thousand dollars. I got news for you now. If you can make a hundred thousand dollars, you just a step away from being a millionaire, man. Because now you hire a few more people to help you out. That that you can do portions of what you do, so you can duplicate that effort. And one more time, just one more time. And do it ten times, man. That sounds hard. It is hard. But what else you got to do? What you gonna stop at the hundred thousand? All you gotta do is duplicate your efforts by ten. You duplicate your efforts by ten, ten times a hundred thousand. Welcome to the club, my friends. You are now a millionaire. Congratulations. You became a millionaire with a ten dollar idea. So stop trying to. Stop bogging yourself down trying to figure out how to make a million. Do what you can do to make ten dollars, and then do the ten by ten theory, inch by inch. Anything's a tip cinch. What do you think the potential is for any human being to live the life they want? What would you say? Okay, some two people said unlimited. Everybody else is quiet. <laughs> I would agree it's really unlimited potential, at least. If you do, give me a oh, yes. So if our potential is unlimited, the question is, do most people's results in life reflect their true potential? Would you say yes or no? Absolutely not. Why not? You tell me. Well, a lot of people say it because they don't take action. I kind of led you with this, right? Yes. But you could be a salesman, and you can knock on a hundred doors and say, "You don't want to buy anything from me, would you?" You may not say that verbally, but your fear, your emotion, could do that. Somebody's going to buy from you out of pity. So a lot of action's helpful, but if you're not certain it's going to work, you won't execute. That's when people say, "I tried that." And whenever you say I've tried that, I know they didn't do think the right thing. So I created this graphic, and you might want to jot it down. Those, those of you at home or yourself, these four words: potential, action, results, and then belief or certainty. And here's how they work in a in a circle. Our potential is amazing, but if you don't believe something's going to work, if you've tried to lose weight before, you tried a diet, it didn't work out well, you don't you don't feel certain anymore, and you're also fearful of failing. So when you're uncertain, do you tap full potential? Yes or no? No, and when you don't think it's going to work, you not only don't take full potential, but are you going to take massive action when you think it's not going to work anyway? So when you use little potential with little action, what kind of results are you going to get? Lousy results. When you get lousy results, what does it do to your belief? Your brain goes, "See, I told you it wouldn't work. See, I told you nothing never happened. See," and then what happens? Less potentials tap, less action, worse results, and now you're on the downward spiral. Who's ever been there in a relationship or with your body, your finances? You know what I mean? Now you might be doing well in one area, like with your kids, you get great movement, but maybe on your finances not so good. So sometimes we're going in different directions. So how would you change this? What would you guys do? Someone yell it out. What would you do to change the momentum? Where would you enter? Would you work on your potential? That's right. You got to believe. So how do you change your belief? 
the way you do it with athletes, because I worked with like the Warriors last year, I worked with the Golden, uh, the, the uh, NHL Champion Stanley Cup, Washington Capitals, you get results in advance. They visualize it as simple as that sounds, but I'm gonna show you, can we pop over here? Yeah. Would you all stand up and I'll show you a quick technique. Oh, you got a technique, we have to learn this right now. <laughs> hey, come on over simple. here. Put your, over here, Yeah. put your feet together straight ahead and then bring your right index forward straight in front of you. And when I say now, I want you to turn clockwise comfortably just as far as you naturally turn, okay? Keep your feet straight, go. Turn clockwise naturally, everyone at home can do it too. Keep your feet straight. See where you end up? Come back around. Take your finger out of your neighbor's ear. <laughs> okay, now close your eyes, it's so simple. Even if you don't think you visualize, you can feel. So I want you to imagine your finger coming up, but imagine it so vividly, it feels like it's coming up. Don't actually do it if you're at home or here, but imagine the finger comes up, and then imagine yourself turning twice as far, and it feels really good. See it, feel it. Open your eyes. Now, turn your finger straight, and now turn as far as you can comfortably and see where you go this time. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> How many of you, how many of you went significantly further? How many went at least 25% further this time? Okay, go. So here's my quick question. Did you have the potential to turn that far the first time? The potential? Potential, yes. Yes. So why didn't you? Because you have beliefs even about how far you can turn, even though you're unaware of them. So you have beliefs about money, you have beliefs about relationship, you have beliefs about business, you have beliefs about your own beauty or strength. And so the way to change them, this is the simplest way I could show you in two minutes, is to condition your mind. Because once the mind is certain, the body will go there. Tell us how your life's better, okay? I don't know how long the session was. Again, there's no script here, baby. I just want to work with you heart to heart to say one thing. If you want to break through, you have to make new decisions. New choices create a new life. The only thing stopping you is some limiting belief. Some belief about how life should be different, you should be different. Deal with life the way it is. Tell yourself the absolute truth. Don't make it worse than it is. Tell yourself the truth, deal with it. Get a vision, get strong, get a strategy, get a role model with a strategy and get into action and then put your focus on taking action every day. Giving, 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 change your approach, you will get there. Every miracle in the Bible has one thing in common, just one thing in common. Trust me on this, I've studied it. The only thing in common, every miracle in the Bible begins with a problem. You never see a miracle in the Bible without a problem first. There's a problem and then a miracle. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is that when you have a problem, you're blessed because you're a candidate for a miracle. You see, the only person that has a problem is the person that doesn't have a problem. <sighs> you see, if you have a little problem, you're a candidate for a little miracle. If you got a big problem, you're a candidate for a big miracle. I mean, choose the problem and choose the miracle. But if you have no problem, you're not a candidate for a miracle. I, I feel badly for you. What sales really is, is the transfer of emotion. That's what's happening when you sell. You're transferring emotion. And the primary emotion that you're transferring is the emotion of certainty. In other words, watch this. You as a salesman, when you enter the encounter, you have to be absolutely certain that your product is the best, makes sense, it's gonna give them the best benefits out there, the best value proposition and so forth, and you are in this state of absolute certainty. So imagine now, we have a continuum of certainty, a line of certainty. So we have this line of certainty, and on one side of the equation we have what's called a one, and the other side, we have a 10. So a 10 represents a state of absolute certainty. Meaning 
your prompt is the best thing since sliced bread. It's gonna give them exactly what they want benefit-wise. It's the best deal for the money. It's gonna make them feel the whole thing, right? It is just absolutely awesome. That's a 10 on the certain scale. It is great, the best thing since sliced bread. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have what's called a one, right? Which is it's the worst piece of shit in the world, right? It's it. It's, it's crap, right? It's, your product is terrible. It's not going to work. Okay. The benefits don't match up what they need. It's overpriced. I don't even want to be near this piece of crap because I, I'll just feel stupid even buying it or even thinking about buying it. That's a one, right? So here's the first thing you need to understand that the moment you open up your mouth to speak as a salesman, you start a sale. The question is this, where is the average prospect, the person you're trying to sell to, where are they on the certainty scale at the beginning? Anyone know, where are they? Who the f knows? You must be in this state of absolute certainty. Because what's happening is this, what you're doing when you're selling is everything that you say, everything that you do, every tonality you use, every gesture you make, every document you hand them, every phrase that comes out of your mouth are all designed to do one simple thing, to essentially raise the prospect's level of certainty to as close to as 10 as a possible. That's what you're doing. You're, the words that you say, the, the, the presentation that you make, the tonalities that you use, every, any documents you have, sales aids, whatever it might be, is all designed to take them from where they are on the certainty scale and move them to as close to where you are as possible. Essentially, you're transferring your white hot certainty to someone who's at a cooler level, at a lower level of certainty. It's almost like this first law, of, I think it's actually the second law of thermodynamics in physics, right? And then you study physics, energy always flows from hot to cold, not the other way around. So you need to be at this white hot level of certainty it's exuding out of you every pore that you have. And we know what certainty feels like and sounds like. We intuitively know as salespeople and our prospects know as well. We know when someone sounds certain and they have confidence and they're enthusiastic. We know what that looks like, feels like, and sounds like. Al Coelho, the author of The Alchemist, once said that when we turn, when you and I turn 23, 24 years old, our brain, something happens to it where we become more logical. We're no longer, oh my gosh, this is possible, I can take over the world. I don't know if I can really take over. It seems kind of impossible if you really think about it. There's no way in the world we can do something like this. So we go into this whole different state of thinking, right? Ah, the possibility of thinking is not out there. Let me explain to you a little bit more about this. Go back 2011. I'm in my room, in my office in Woodland Hills. Why by Warner, Warner Center Marriott? I have made a friend. I had known him for four or five years. We've done business together. Very smart guy. Loved him. Loved his wife. Good looking family. Went to Wharton Business School. Sharp as hell. Brilliant guy. He comes to me after meeting at Cheesecake Factory because he says, I'd like to invest. I want you to be the CEO. I want to be your COO president. We go build this company together. I said, great, let's meet. So we finally meet in the office. It's 1230. We're about to finalize the information to go into contract. And the number we agreed at this time, there's nothing taking place good at this time with the company. We're trying to build it. It's a lot of work. Well, we've been around for a year and a half. There's some track record. So we come up with this number around a half a million dollars for 10% of the company. You know what he ends up telling me that night? Here's what he says. He says, you know what, Patrick? I said, what's that? Uh, I feel like you're a very good negotiator and you're very good in sales. I said, okay, that's, that's a good thing. That, that just means that you're very smart to team up with somebody like that. That's a very good salesperson negotiator because you've told me before that's not your strength. Your strength is more operational technology. Yes. I said, so what, do you want to team up with a guy that is opposite strengths to you who's not in, good, in sales? And go, I'm, I'm trying to understand what you're saying with this. He says, well, I just don't know if I'm going to get the best deal here. I said, let me get this straight. You're getting 10% for only half a million dollars. 
and I'm doing this because I want you part of our team. I, I just think you're selling me. There's some stuff I don't know about. I said, okay, no problem. We went our separate ways. Do you realize if we would have came with that investment, his investment's gonna be somewhere between 15 to $20 million today, and he would have excelled. What happened? Wharton Business School, way too logical. Everything was about, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? I could just almost watch him thinking he went all logical. He didn't see the emotional side. He didn't see the social capital, the vision of what we have going on. And he was afraid because he second guessed himself. So you know, you know what it's like? Let me explain a little bit deeper for you here so it makes sense to you. When you're 16, you're a girl, you're in high school, 10th grade, 11th grade, someone flirts with you. It's cute, you like it. Like, oh my gosh, I think he likes me. It's nice. You share it with your friends. When you're 45, you're single, maybe divorced, and you meet another man, he's divorced. And you meet him somewhere, he comes and talks to you. The approach sometimes is different. You know what happens? Here's what happens. Wait a minute. I know what you're trying to do. You're flirting with me, right? Yes. I know what you want. You only care about one thing. You're just trying to get in my pants. I I'm sorry, what do you mean? All you want from me is one thing. All men, all they want is one thing. Skeptic, logical. When you're skeptic, logical, the guy says, uh, eventually I'm hoping I get into your pants because that's what people, if I like you, like me, we should probably go in the bedroom and have some fun together, right? You, you, no, you, you're not. Yes. What's wrong if I'm flirting with you? I'm trying to woo you and chase you. Sometimes your dreams are flirting with you, but you're not letting your dreams flirt because all you're doing is saying, I know what you're trying to do with me. You're just trying to get into my pants. Of course your dreams are trying to get into your pants. Your dreams is here. They want to get into here. You're not letting them, you're guarding them. So you don't let anybody in. You know what happens when you do that? You live a life with no dreams becoming a reality. Do you really want that life? If you don't want that life, you have to open this up a little bit. And you have to set aside some of the logical thinking, allow for opportunities to come up that get you closer and closer and closer to your dreams.